Hi everyone, my name is Shannon Brett and I am the curator of the exhibition Rite of Passage. I'm a proud Waka Waka Garang Garang and bachelor person currently based in Mianjin, Brisbane. I would like to take uh, this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional owners upon the beautiful land upon which I am living, um, honouring ancestors and all Indigenous peoples of this country, past and present. And I'm delighted to welcome you um, to another in our series of uh, panel talks today, highlighting two outstanding artists in Lola Greeno and Julie Goff. Hello there, artists. How are you going? Hello. Hi. Uh, Lola, can we start with you? So um, I'm, I'm really interested in your work and, and the process of your work and how these intricate, delicate um, strands of shells um, come together. Like, can you tell us uh, about yourself and your life as um, an Aboriginal uh, woman and artist? Yeah, my name's Lola Greeno. I'm an Aboriginal elder. I was born on Cape Barren Island, um, which was sort of like my, well, the introduction to, um, you know, I grew up there as a child up until I was about 10. And the beach obviously was about 100 yards from where we lived. And we lived on several acres of ground and we were fairly sustainable. But I guess the most important things for us was, you know, me going to the beach with the elders. Um, and I remember mm. the elders coming to our house after church on a Sunday and we'd walk along the beach with them and mum and pick up shells and put in our pocket or give to them if they were busy talking. And, of course, from my dad being European, but he still took the boys out in the bush and taught them how to, you know, snare the kangaroos. And, and so we lived quite natural life in a sense because we lived on fish Beautiful. and mutton birds and kangaroos. But, you know, the most the part of that journey of being a shell necklace maker, um, you know, I didn't sort of pick up so much, but when we we, we used to go away as a family to the Mutton Bird Island um, from March till April each year, and we learned from our elders even then. So we they worked six days a week, and on the seventh day, they the women obviously would go to the beach, and the men would go off fishing or go and visit other sheds, and so that was my first part of learning from one of my aunties on the island. Wow. And I found that very enjoyable. But it wasn't, uh, then we moved from Cape Barren because I got rheumatic fever and, and it was very difficult to get, um, you know, medical access on the island because everything relied on boats. No planes came in. There were no phones in those days. So mum and dad decided to move us because that we were, you know, a family of seven or eight children and so we moved to Flinders Island to live. But that continued, you know, our, our culture continued there. Yeah. We still visited the beach as young children. And um, But my mum focused more on making sure we were cared for. And so she paused in making a necklaces for some time yeah. until I moved here to... to live in Launceston in 1972 and then went to do a bridging course and an associate diploma and everyone was, you know, were asking me about where I came from and what I did and what my mum did and wanted to know about these necklaces, but I wanted to keep it, you know, to me it was keep it in my heart, it wasn't to share. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't until, you know, you, you, you looked and learned about other artists and you thought, well, you know, you have to talk about where you come from and, and what your experiences are, because otherwise you, there's, there's, your story goes with the value of your work in a sense, you know, that, mm. that were some of the thoughts. And so the, I guess initially I started making and making, make sure that I work with my mum while she was still with us, you know, while she was still alive. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. And I'm lucky that I did because her and I had an exhibition together in Queensland, you know, through another Aboriginal woman. When was that? Came, you know, Oh, gosh. Fiona Foley came to Tassie and, and we did some amazing things with Fiona and I took her back to Cape Barren for a weekend and, and she took some necklaces back with her and then she went off overseas to Chile. So whatever that first 
trip to Chile that Fiona Foley did. Okay. Uh, the necklaces were posted and paid all this insurance and didn't arrive in time for Fiona. To, she wanted to take some with her. And, oh, uh, okay, but yeah. they still arrived that they went on display in her gallery, her main gallery that she had at the time, and they were sold. And that's when uh, uh, Mum and my necklaces went to the, you know, the National Gallery. Um, acquired some for their collection so um, how beautiful which, which was sort of the start of you know and from then onwards I think when I graduated as a Bachelor of Fine Arts um, for six months I just did projects and I thought wow this is amazing you know to be invited into these exhibitions on the mainland and um, and so the, you know the ball went rolling and um, I think I've continued since and and once it we start pausing it a little bit. I think, well, what should I be doing in this community for my my family and the young people? So yeah, um, you know, in in this latest project, um, I've called it Rena Marpoline Nimanina Kalakina, which is about lots of shells, grasses, and and um, seaweed or kelp. So that's the the uh, workshops that we've been doing, and one of the workshops has been just my family, which has been amazing oh, feeling that is amazing. Really, to, yeah, wow. to teaching my nieces and great nieces have been in this um, group of women in Launceston. So and passing still, on that knowledge. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm still not finished. I mean, I'm thinking that I might have lots of workshops in the new year so that more great. young people can come in and they can spend the whole full day with me. I'm thinking two hours is not enough, you know. With no me. way. <laughs> Yeah, they get so oh, excited. Oh, it sounds, yeah, <laughs> because you just get warmed up after about an hour, wouldn't you? You do. Well, I see, I do a slide presentation to them. Oh, whether yeah. Whether it's on the shelves and, and then the weaving and the grasses and the kelp will probably won't be uh, so many slides or as much information um, as the other two uh, workshops were, but um, still very interesting in a sense. I mean, I've... I've inspired one of my nieces so much that um, she wants to grow all the weaving plants and and she wants to have some workshops at the home on her back veranda, which is really, oh, it's a lovely. really nice feeling. That's yeah. so great. You know, she's mm. inspired. Yep. Yes. Oh, that's fascinating, Lola. I, I think um, um, I'd love to hear more of that when we have a look at your work in the exhibition. We'll just... Um, go to that shortly but I'll um, hear from Julie right now if you can tell us your a little bit about your story but so Lola you're in Launceston but Julie you're in Hobart yeah and so your practice takes you um, all over the place but um, I especially love all of your travels throughout Tasmania and your photographic works which I've seen a lot of it's so fantastic um, it's just so much imagery of Tasmania. Um, can you tell us about your cultural and artistic journey thus far? Sure. Um, so, yeah, I live in Hobart, which this is the traditional country of the Muanina people um, who, who didn't survive the British arrival colonisation. So I've been here since the 90, end of 93, I moved to Tasmania. So I grew up on mainland Australia and my life story is pretty much one of reconnecting and relearning and thinking well kind of finding what what I should be doing in a sense I think that's life's journey uh, so yeah I grew up in Melbourne and my grandmother moved to Melbourne from northern Tasmania where my family have been since the 1840s in the La Trobe area so um, I'm one of the large family from Dalrymple Briggs who um, was her mother's from northeast Tasmania. Her mother was Waratamaratiana, and that uh, she was a daughter of Manalagana, one of the um, leaders of the East Coast and Flangmaremina people. But um, yeah, Waratamaratiana was living with a man called Briggs, a sealer, George Briggs. And I come from one of her four surviving children, Dalrymple, who was taken by a colonist, um, a surgeon when she was a child and we're not sure of the circumstances for how this happened but a lot of my work is trying to understand what happened in the first 50 years of the British arriving and to family members in particular but 
all of our ancestors really because it seemed to be the general sense of what happened or nonsense was to remove us our ancestors from country and remove children from adults and so that it's caused to this day um, some different experiences between some families and also a large the largest uh, um, amount of the Aboriginal community were exiled long a long time on the islands um, but yeah in my family story, Del Wimple Briggs, um, although she was born, um, it said she was born on Little Kangaroo Island near, I think that's near Flinders Island. Lola might know. Yeah. Little Kangaroo Island. Um, yeah. That she, yeah, she didn't stay out there. She was basically living around Longford and Launceston as a child. And by the 1840s, she uh, petitioned the government for her mother to be released from Waibalena. So the story is, for my family, is just... Um, everywhere, anytime you can find out something about your family, you find out about yourself and yeah. kind of um, it's so important to tr to also share that with family members. So there's, there's as Lola does, there's stories and there's skills and traditions. My, my immediate family didn't maintain the shell necklace tradition. So it's only through the kindness um, of, of people such as Lola. Lola created that opportunity for our community to uh, our broad community to start sharing back across families that which has all but been lost or asleep at least so um i've been really fortunate to be here at in these decades where change and um cultural reawakenings of and sharings are happening because it would have been a much um different time you know in the 70s or the 80s than now yeah yeah mm. oh absolutely gosh it sounds fascinating like the way that you're um you really are retracing your family um and it the result is is that learning more and more about yourself and understanding your journey I think I just yeah, feel well, like you're really funny. understanding so yeah like it, it's family members yeah I mean yeah. so what about the way that you see your work do you see it as um educational or do you see it as like political or activism mm -hmm. or like a transferring of knowledge to next generations I I just feel like I your mm -hmm. work it is a combination of so many things um it, yeah it is a bit of a mixture because um there's a, a need to uh, share what has happened on this island beyond the Aboriginal community, because it's, I mean, it's embedded in us, like in that idea of genetic or blood memory. We feel what has happened, the specifics. Um, I can keep looking for the specific details of what has happened in, um, to try and explain for ourselves, but it's broader than that. The need is for the general population to understand yeah. uh, and what it means, the impact of being removed from country and the continuing impact of of fences and gates and lack of access. But in, in sharing this information through art, um, there's a sense that you can change things because more and more, uh, for example, more and more interested, sensitive, non-Aboriginal people who, for example, have land, large amounts of land here are um, coming to look at themselves more carefully. So, and, so what is happening as a, a result of these artworks in different locations that I can show them and more and more in Tasmania which I didn't do previously is more opportunities to show on the mainland than here gallery wise and project wise but having shown work more recently here I'm finding people are um, more engaged with bringing like offering space for Aboriginal people to come onto country onto what are otherwise seen as closed properties to undertake cultural activities and traditional burning and then there's some uh, one particular family to date has actually bequested like given land back to the Aboriginal community. So I feel that there's a movement wow. that can gain momentum that can really change the way that we, I feel still pretty much locked out of a lot of Tasmania right now, though. Mm. Well, um, here's hope for the future. I mean, seriously. Yeah. Um, I just want to. Um, take a look at some images right now, um, if you don't mind. I'm just gonna have a look here at these, um, a few images that I have of each of your works. 
And um, I'll just get some arrows happening here. I'll go back to the beginning. And Lola, I'd like to start with your work. Um, that's part of the exhibition. Um, your three works, uh, can you, I'm really sorry about my pronunciation um, of your <laughs> beautiful language. Can you help me? Is it Mabana, Lavara yeah. and Tibalak? Yeah, it, 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 and, and mind you, the people working in Palo Alto probably pronounce it quite differently. And I usually choose the words because those different those pieces of work are related to certain areas or or to people sometimes and places and I think um, these were related to different places that I've lived that I remember. Okay. Um, you know, this is the um, black crow, which black is a common crow name. shells. Yeah, the black crow shells, and which is. I mean, you can get these shells all the way from Tasmania right up to Norlamboy, I think. Um, and I remember going to a conference once in Canberra um, and a conference in an exhibition called Art on a String. Um, and I had a workshop and I took some shells with me and um, I think one of the women were there and she got quite excited when she found that I had some of these black shells with me. Um, but they get the, they get them much bigger where she lived, which might have been on Elko Island. And, oh, um, yeah, yep. Rose, I think. And uh, yep. she said, oh, we eat the fish from them. Well, ours is, I mean, we probably could eat the fish from some of these. Um, these are sort of what I'd call a medium size. You can get them a bit bigger than this. Um, so... Um, you know, that's quite often the way I start thinking and depending what the, what the theme of the exhibition is, is sometimes um, draws my interest and I decide, because I was in, you know, I've got work in four shows with Rites of Passage and, and, well, the other one doesn't go up till next year, I don't think, one that University of New South Wales is doing. Oh, wow. Um, yep. So, and are there black crow shells in that one? Uh, in the other exhibitions, mm. I know that I've got work in um, this. This next one is the basis of it. Those very tiny little shells are the rice shells. Oh, I love the rice and, shells. Yeah, the the rice shells, and they're quite fragile, so we don't put them in in bracelets because you put your wrist on a table and you probably crush them. Yeah. And you can um, usually thread these with the needle and thread. We don't pierce them prior to that at all. Um, oh, right. Okay. And, and they come in the white and that colour, don't they? No, it's that just, oh, yes, you can get some white ones, but that's like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Oh, okay. Um, all right. There's um, just uh, one about to go to the National Gallery of Australia collection. Oh, lovely. Which has been a one-off one. You must go and see it sometime. And, what is it? Um, I will if I can get there. Yeah, that's the juvenile rice shell one. Yeah. So it's yeah. um, before it's matured, so it's got the little points on it, and that's all that, that it's made of. It's it's uh, probably a one-off. What? One. Oh my goodness! Wow. Yeah. Oh, can and I just can, can I just go back to that? Just yeah, go sure. back to that image. So it is all bright sh rice shells. This the other one, one piece. Gone, yeah, that's right. How long yeah. does it take to string? Oh, it takes takes weeks and weeks usually to. Yeah, my, my eyes are getting weak, as you can imagine now. And um, so I can't thread them overnight, you know. Yeah. I, put, I suppose under a good, but then your fingers also get sore. So that's why I usually try and mix them up. Like in this one, we've got some assorted shells. Oh, this is beautiful, this one. And, yeah. and some white kelp shells in this, plus the grey gull shell and a few mariners. Yeah, okay. So it's a bit of assortment. Was that button shells? Oh no, the button shells are in this buttons one. In this one. Yep. Yeah, okay. stripey buttons. Stripey button shells. Stripey buttons. You can see the little ring or little rings of of colour going around next and to near, next to the black crow shell. The black crow shells and the mariner. And what were the white ones? The toothies. The, the toothies. And then yep. the, these are the common names that the old women call them. And she, I think they named nearly thirty. I think. If I can remember, that's something I've been doing for this project because we are going to do a publication for oh, my current beautiful. project as well. And I'm actually, what's going to go in it is things that I talk about that I've never written down before. 
So that's going to be interesting. Oh, Some I can't say, wait. When is the publication out? Do you know? Uh, we're going to launch this project in June next year. Oh, yes. Okay. So, um, all right. You know, it's not too far away. Not far away at all. No. Okay. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, thank you for that quick uh, look at the shells. Um, we have them. Um, they're, they're hanging the same in Cairns as they were in the Brisbane exhibition too, right. which is beautifully um, up against the wall, um, just so beautifully hanging there. Um, and it shows the, um, shows the audience how long this, these strands yeah. actually are. They're, they're so yeah. long um, and beautiful. Yeah, about 180 centimetres. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they're so beautiful. Um, and we'll just have a look at your work, uh, Julie, Crime Scene Survivor. Um, so new work um, also, 2019 and 20. Um, mm. Here is an install shot, and this um, photograph was taken at the Brisbane iteration of the exhibition. Um, can you tell us about this um, Phenomenal work. Yeah. Um, and also about your, is it Ter Terina? Your, uh, yeah, your it's basket. One of for, for a basket. One of, yeah. the old, one of the language words for basket, Tirana. Tirana. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, well, it's, um, so I made it the film last year because um, I had a uh, great opportunity for a, a solo exhibition in the museum in Hobart called Tense Past and uh, I realized that it was there was a bit of a gap if I didn't include this story in in as a new work so um and earlier in the year I I made the film earlier last year but then I've re-edited it for the for the solo exhibition so what what it is is um based on uh something that I, I was told about by a family member that a uh, the account of Dalrymple Briggs, who I've mentioned earlier, one of my ancestors being shot and uh, survived being sh shot by a man that referred to her as his black servant. And she referred to him in the, in the police re report as, as her master. And because it fortunately survived as um, documentation in, the, in, the manu in a manuscript in the National Library in Canberra, this is how we know that what others have written since the 1830s about this relationship with this man um, is untrue. So different books have are written about Dalrymple living with Jacob Mountgarrett and his wife and that she was beloved like a daughter and they taught her to read, write and sew. So there's this kind of mythological writing about her life, her early life as though it was um, idyllic and perfect and not yeah. about... Um, the, what happened like how the she happened reality to them is, yeah the reality is really shocking so um that police um magistrate report with the witness accounts really blows it out of the water and shows yeah. the terminology of the time and how she is also just one of more than 200 children over uh nearly 50 years aboriginal children in tasmania were living with colonists and pretty much taken by colonists yeah uh, there's some in the orphan asylum but a majority were living with uh, men or couples such as Mount Garrett. And so this is the transcript. I typed out the original report that's held in Canberra. And um, over some years, I've um, re revisited the account, but this is the first time I decided to move it into footage, into a film, um, partly because I got the kind of courage or determination to visit where it exactly happened, which is on private property near Longford on an estate that's called Brickenden nowadays, okay. owned by the Archer family since three years after the shooting, which is when Mount Garrett died and his land was absorbed by another, by um, the Brickenden estate. So do they I know, thought, do they know about this story, um, that family? They, they do now. They, they, it was written about in the 1950s. So I think that that was um, local memory and folklore that's the only other time that I've seen it anywhere the shooting about the shooting apart from in the library manuscript the original police account so I can't believe that yeah yeah it so, was, thank goodness that the transcript was recorded like 
yeah and preserved yeah well that's all of it in its entirety is in the film so the film Mm. is the length of the transcript like how long it takes is kind of what determined the length of the film and a lot of my film works are based on the experience like they determine themselves what length they must be um so yeah and so when I showed it in um, my solo exhibition in, in Hobart, I managed to loan from the farmer what they've ploughed up from the site in a case. So this 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 experience to be um, in rites of passage enabled me to, um, so I didn't think I needed or wanted to try and loan what they've ploughed up, which are bits of pottery and um, etc from where she lived because there's no other evidence there that the hut was there that she lived in uh, mm-hmm. when she survived that shooting but I, d- I thought about how much we <clears throat> I'm so proud that she went and on to have a very s- successful life managed to m- extricate her mother from Flinders Island and um, we come from you know big and f- I think robust family so I um, thought I would rather think about the survival and how I can work through and create my first finished basket because I think I'm a bit of a slow learner when it comes to baskets because I've had ample opportunity with great people sharing this with me while I have worked on a previous project curating our weaving work, but I never gained the confidence or the determination to complete. So I had two unfinished small baskets and then I started this from from the beginning, like new for this project, and used to all all the plants um, were from my garden, original weaving plants, and also from the um, from Brickenden, the place where she lived before it was called Brickenden. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I think it was just I wanted to show almost like she's in the film watching, and she's right there that that we survived and can continue culture and we can learn again what might appear not to be, you know, awake within us. So it's a pretty, that's so uh, beautiful. it's a wonky basket, but it, it, it feels to me like. Oh, I love it. <laughs> the, the, the t- also the top section, it, it's, uh, or I don't even know what you call the top of a basket. It's like a lip um, and yeah. the way that the handle is attached to the basket, it's beautiful. And I can't believe it's your first basket, your first oh, well, completed I, one when I you were telling me. I was like, what? This is great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I didn't, make, I made it fairly quickly, but I had, uh, um, yeah, as Lola well knows, the, our basket revitalization, uh, rebirth, bringing back to life, all of this is also due to Lola creating a project. Um, I don't know when that was now. It was so, um, um, was it 2006? 2009 we launched it I think the exhibition Um, yeah Yeah. so it was called Tayenabi which means exchange and Lola created workshops for people to come together and relearn and share what they know about our weaving which is very specific twined uh style of uh something like fantastic uh, northern Queensland and Arnhem Land in fact but yeah so I really was part of of that project but didn't really gain the confidence I, like I said, until I felt the necessity for this to, I didn't think the film was enough to to show that I'm part of that. I'm the result of her life, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the work um, sits together as this tactile, this beautiful um, basket, this object next to the film. I think it just, it, it really works, you know, this basket standing there proudly as well. Well, you, you made the perfect suspension mode, so thank you. Oh, Roger. isn't it a great? Um, I, I'd like to show out, um, shout out to Blair from QUT Art Museum for that one. He's a genius yeah. when it comes to um, mm. install and producing these great um, uh, structures um, to yeah. support. Yeah, yeah, it's so perfect. beautiful. Um, so mm. I'll just stop this um, share now. And um, I just want to thank you both, really, um, for being part of the exhibition and um, also for today for this fantastic um, brief little look through um, at your artworks. And um, I just really want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you for being um, part of Rite of Passage. And um, I'm sure all the artists, other artists feel the same way. It's been a... um, 
a great journey and um, uh, I think uh, an everlasting memory for all of us to be part of this project. Yeah, yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.